Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight, uh, to be on this panel uh, with such great speakers. Uh, they're lucky, they're only speaking largely about one country in 10, 15 minutes. I've been given a whole continent uh, to speak about. Even if I spent less than a minute on each country, I still wouldn't have enough time. But um, I'm going to try my best to really try to look at some of the insights we can gather, even just by looking at the last two months of what's occurred uh, in in South America. So I think that provides some really important insights into the turbulent times that we are living in today. If we look at the events that have been occurring across the region, we can see on the one hand how the global trends of revolt, the theme of tonight's uh, uh, discussion, are also present in South America. At the same time, we can see how this global trend has been influenced by regional politics, the pink tide that, that Sue referred to, or the name generally given to the election of centre, centre-left, radical left governments that have occurred over the last two decades in the region, and also the national peculiarities or the national political situation in each country. So I want to look at, for instance, in the last two months, how we've seen the eruption of a wave of protests and revolt, particularly in three countries, Ecuador, Chile, and more recently, Colombia. In each of them, we've seen protests against essentially what could be broadly defined as neoliberal or austerity measures. In the case of Ecuador, uh, well, generally against the application of an international monetary fund package, uh, very specifically provoked by the rise in fuel prices. Um, in Chile, seen uh, 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 the protests kicked off by a, a hike in fare prices for the subway, the underground train system. And in Colombia, the, the trigger for this round of protests being the trade union national strike called around the question of uh, attacks on pensions, the youth minimum wage, and attempts to privatise certain national companies. So you can see a, a general uh, a, um, correlation between the, well, the politics behind these and very much apply to a lot of the other sort of protests that you will give or take the different situations in a lot of different countries, but that have been triggers for protests uh, in other parts of the world. We also see, though, how in each of these different countries, the protests have taken a different trajectory, largely influenced by the recent history of these countries and the, the national politics in these countries. So, for instance, in Ecuador, a country that until recently was governed by a uh, what could be broadly defined within the context of the pink tide as a radical left government, uh, the government of Rafael Correa, who's, uh, because of the constitutional limit on term, uh, on, uh, term restrictions, uh, had to find a new candidate from his own party, uh, Lenin Moreno, who was elected, but very quickly uh, shifted away from the more radical stance that Rafael Correa uh, had taken. Um, and as I said, essentially moved towards implementing an international monetary fund package. In this context, in Ecuador, you also had a divided left, both divided in terms of the governing party, which itself is split, uh, Lancia Pais, uh, the pro-Korea supporters having set up their own party now because of what they feel has been Moreno's betrayal, but also social movements divided over the legacy of the Korea government, those that were more closely aligned with Korea, those that were more uh, hostile to, towards Korea. In this context, we see largely indigenous-led protests, uh, although not exclusively uh, indigenous protests, uh, against um, the, the hike in fuel prices, that leads to what could largely be described as a, as a victory, but certainly a partial victory. So the decree to, inc to uh, increase the fuel prices gets rolled back, but at the same time a process of negotiation begins to stop really protests continuing on some of the other aspects of the IMF package. At the same time, based on the divisions amongst the left, the government has used this opportunity to dialogue with one section of the left, essentially those that are more pro Moreno, uh, and at the same time persecuting the pro Correa elements to the point of having MPs that have been jailed uh, and accused of terrorism for acts that occurred uh, during these protest movements. Very different situation, though, is in, it occurred in Chile. In Chile, we've had a right wing government uh, in power there with Sebastián Piñera. Uh, previously, was it, debatable whether it was part of the pink tide when the Socialist Party under Bachelet was was a, was a, the, the president. Um, being generous to describe it as centre left, as a centre government, but that they generally went along with this process of regional integration that occurred under the under the pink tide. But what has happened in? In, in Chile, 
a complete refusal from the government to negotiate. Instead, a ramping up of repression and essentially declaring that Chile was at war, uh, declaring up a huge polarization uh, in society that has only spurred bigger protests and has shifted the focus of the protests beyond just simply a question of the hike in um, prices for public transport to a broader question of, of, of the political setup that has existed in Chile for the last 30 years. And this is captured in some of the slogans. Slogans such as, it's not about 30 pesos, it's about 30 years. And it is referring to the, the 30 years of so-called transition to democracy um, since the Pinochet dictatorship ended. But it's also reflected in other, other slogans, the idea of Chile has awoken, uh, and also the idea of, if you won't let us dream, we won't let you sleep. Another, another slogan that has, that has been very much raised in this protest. And what this has led is to concretely to demands, for instance, for a constituent assembly to redraft a new constitution, to create the new democracy um, that, that Chileans want. So as I said, a very different outcome or different, different route that the protests have taken uh, in Chile. And, and again, if we look at Colombia, once again, even though a very similar uh, beginning point, again, a different, a different outcome that's occurred, largely based on its recent history, which has been distorted or impacted on by, firstly, a 50-year guerrilla insurgency that only recently came to an end due to a peace accord, um, uh, the non-existence or, or certainly the cutting off of, the, of any kind of pink tide element in that country, uh, largely if we wanted to talk about the emergence of a pink tide in Colombia, we'd have to go back to the mid-80s with the Patriotic Union, the attempts by the guerrillas to form a political party, which was uh, literally uh, you know, killed off by the fact that 5,000 of its leaders were, were killed in a massacre, that, uh, in, a, in, a, in concerted assassination attempts and uh, killings of, of mayors that were elected from the Patriotic Union uh, and leaders of the party. Uh, as I said, the peace accords that have been agreed to, but the ongoing killing of social leaders, um, and also heavily influenced by the crisis in Venezuela, which is just, just on, on its border. All of this has led to a very strong hesitancy or, 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 or a, 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 a lack of willingness to really identify with, with the left in, in general in Colombia, given this very complex situation where being a leftist is essentially the same as declaring yourself as pro-guerrilla, pro-terrorist. Uh, you know, this, this is a way that, that, that is very commonly referred to in the media and by the government's spokespeople. So what we've seen is that under the umbrella of a trade union national strike by the very specific policies, a whole bunch of different groups, sectors of society have come behind that national strike that was called on November 21. Indigenous groups, environment groups, women's groups, students' groups, etc. joined in and brought their own protests as well and turned this into a protest to demand a different type of Colombia. Uh, one that, a, 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 a realisation that the current rival government cannot provide any kind of real sense of justice or peace um, for, for Colombia, but in a context where there is no real, real left presence. Okay. Um, okay. There's a bag of plenty of stuff to say. Um, so, as, as we can see, a general, general globalized, you know, how, how this globalized revolt is present in South America, or certainly at least in those three countries that I mentioned. As I said, I can't go through all the countries in the region. But in each case, to take a different trajectory, outcomes yet to be determined in some places, or fully determined, have, have, have occurred at a different rate, influenced by regional, national, and even in some cases, local realities of what's been occurring on, on the ground. But of course, to simply talk about this would be to only look at one side of the coin of what's occurred in the last two months. Um, whilst in Argentina, we've had the re-election of the centre-left Kirchnerist project, uh, after a, a period of government of the right-wing Mauricio Macri uh, uh, government. Uh, we've seen, as mentioned, a coup in Bolivia that has overthrown 14 years of indigenous rule in that country and has begun a, a, essentially a, a reign of persecution slash borderline terror on, on social movements in that country. There's already seen two massacres that have occurred in protests in, the, in those countries and an attempt to basically uh, wipe out the movement towards socialism, the party that had helped elect Evo Morales as the Bolivia's first indigenous president, an attempt to essentially wipe it out of, the, uh, out of the political map, so that by the time free and fair elections can be called in Bolivia, the left doesn't really exist as a, as a viable alternative in that country. We've also seen the election of a right-wing government in Uruguay, again after several years of centre-left government uh, by the Frente Amplio, and we've seen, in, in the case of Brazil earlier this year, so in the last two months, 
of earlier this year, the inauguration of essentially a far-right um, uh, president in the, in the form of Jair Bolsonaro, uh, who's, if, if one may not go as far as to call his government as fascist government, certainly his ideology is, is a fascist ideology. He himself very clearly identifies with the dictatorship period of, of, of Brazil. In fact, his, his only criticism of the dictatorship in Brazil was that it didn't go far enough in wiping out the left, and hence why we have the, have the, have, have the so-called problem of the Workers' Party uh, that exists today uh, in Brazil, and why being the most popular candidate in the presidential elections, Lula da Silva from the Workers' Party had to be jailed under false charges in order to stop him from being able to run, although we have seen in the last two months. But first, he's freeing from jail, and essentially, he's clearly, clearly largely, he's clearing of, of his name. But we also see, even if we go back to the three countries that I mentioned, Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, that the difficulties or the challenges faced uh, in a context of where there were these popular protests, because on the one hand, the President Piñera has record low approval ratings, 13%. The protests have very large level of support, 59% of the country support the protest, and 73% is a poll from early December. Uh, I feel that no matter what happens, something positive will come out of the current situation in Chile. So, uh, you know, central sense that even if we don't sympathise with the protesters themselves, that this will generate something good for the country as a whole. But at the same time, all of the left, from the centre to the far left, have essentially declined in their support uh, in, in, in Chile, in large part because of their involvement in the political system and in Parliament and the deals they've been trying to make uh, in trying to resolve the, the, the current situation. Meanwhile, some of the more uh, far-right, extreme-right candidates have slowly, slowly been gathering support in, in the polls in this context. So I think that's the other side of the context, I think, that we have to look at and we can't ignore. And if, 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 if we want to try and ignore it, we can't because we can just look at the UK election results today to start to see that, that element. That it, we can't always just look at the one side without looking at the other side of politics. What we see is that in this context of generalised revolt and crisis, the right trying to wreak it here and in order to try and retake governmental power and in the context of South America via democratic or undemocratic means or a mixture of both. So what, what does this all mean? What can we draw from this? I think on the one hand, it's important to draw the optimism of the protests that we're seeing on the streets, of people fighting back. Without that, we have no hope of being able to change society. So that's, that's a certain huge positive that, that we have on, on our side. But it's also important to patiently study and analyse what is, what is really going on in order to figure out how we can go ahead. So for instance, if I feel from pointing out the four things that I would say, the necessity to acknowledge and understand the differences that occur. Not, not every protest is the same, that protests take on their different forms, different facets, influenced by regional, national, uh, local, local factors. Um, and these can play out in different ways, in different forms, like for instance the vote that occurred in, in the UK where you have strong votes in, on one hand for Labour in, within London and then in the north of England and a total wipeout, you know, essentially a wipeout of, of the Labour Party there. Trying to understand these different realities that exist within the one same country. Um, another side as well is to look at trying to understand what is the actual balance of forces, you know, just because there's a lot of people on the streets, we can't forget that there are a lot of people still not on the streets. And what are they thinking about what's occurring in this context? And on the basis of that, figuring out well, how, do we, how do we move forward? What are the tactics in order to continue to expand and build on this protest movement? It's also clearly shown that we need to have a vision for a different way of doing politics. That simply thinking that we can be the left of the political class doesn't work. And in fact, those forces that have tried to do that have paid a very heavy political price for doing so. All of this, I think, then brings to the final point, the actual need for a political organisation, whatever you want to call it, a party, a political instrument, a movement, a front, that, that, that's secondary uh, as to what it's called. But the need for an organisation that can bring together activists that can reflect all of these different realities, as I said, that exist even within one country, to share their experiences, to discuss and debate what are the current balance of forces where they live, what are the tactics in order to be able to move forward that campaign, what is the kind of vision and program and struggle that needs to be put forward. This is really, uh, to quote a, a former Australian Prime Minister, the real great challenge of our generation that we face in building that kind of political organisation so that we can turn these revolts into actual revolution and, and fundamental change.